In the last video, we developed the SIR model of disease spread. We had some equations that said S is the number of susceptible, I is the number of infected, and R is the number of recovered kids during a measles ep epidemic. We said that S prime was minus a constant times S times I, I prime was plus that constant times S times I, minus another constant times I, and R prime was plus that constant times I. And we called this constant B, we call this constant A. So now let's take a particular instance where this constant is 1 14th and this constant is 0. 0.00001 and where you originally have 45,400 susceptible kids, 2,100 infected kids, 2,500 recovered kids out of a total population of 50,000 kids. So we've got our model what does it tell us? What good is a model? So I'm going to show you two ways to use the model to predict the future. One of them is numerical, the other is analytic. We'll do the numerical one first. So the numerical one is we just use these equations to figure out at what rate are S, I, and R changing. So if these are the values of S, I, and R, then you just compute. S prime is minus 0.00001 times s times i, and that works out to negative 953.4. So that means that the rate at which kids are, are getting sick is 953.4 kids per day. Now, of course, there aren't going to be exactly 953.4 kids that get, get, that get sick in a, in a given day. Kids come in whole quantities, among other things, but this is a mathematical model. It says you should expect roughly 953.4 newly infected kids each day. And you should expect roughly 150 newly recovered kids each day. And so the net number of infected, the number that gets sick minus the number that recover, is going to be 803.4. And these are all measured in units of kids per day. Fine. If you know how fast something's changing, you should be able to figure out where you were going to be tomorrow. So tomorrow you say, hmm, if the number of susceptible is dropping at a rate of 953.4 per day, then the number of susceptibles tomorrow should be the number of susceptibles today minus 953.4. So we should expect the number of susceptibles tomorrow to be around 44,446.6. The number of infected tomorrow is the number of infected today plus the rate at which is changing times one day. So that's 2100 plus 803.4, 2903.4. The number of recovered was the 2100 that we, sorry, the 2500 that had already recovered plus the 150 per day makes 2650. Okay, that tells you what, what to expect tomorrow. What about the next day? Well, you have your equations. These are equations are perfectly true tomorrow. You plug in the values of S, I, and R tomorrow, and you get the value of S prime, I prime, and R prime tomorrow. So we're counting in days, so S of 0 is today, S of 1 is tomorrow, S of 2 is the day after. So you use the values tomorrow to figure out the rates of change tomorrow from the rate equations. And then you say the number the day after tomorrow is roughly the number tomorrow plus tomorrow's rate of change times one day. And then you can use those values to figure out S prime of 2, I prime of 2, R prime of 2, and keep repeating. It's tedious, but that's what computers are good for. You program them and they do all the hard work for you. You can also use the equations to run backwards. If you know how fast things are changing and you know where they are today, you can extrapolate backwards to get a pretty good sense of where they were yesterday. Instead of adding the rate of change times one day, you subtract the rate of change times one day and you get good approximations to where we were yesterday. So numerically, you can use the equations to go forwards in time or go backwards in time, 
and then you get a graph and you say, aha, everything's going to be okay, or uh-oh, everybody's going to get sick, or somewhere in between. Now we can also do some analysis without any number crunching. Let's look back at the equation for i. The rate at which i is changing is asi minus bi, where in this instance a was 0. 0.00001 and b was 1 14th. Okay. And we can factor out the i and say that it's as minus b times i. Well, you notice that if s is bigger than b over a, this is positive. And that means that the epidemic's growing. Each day there are going to be more sick people than the day before. But if s is less than b over a, then the rate of change is negative. The epidemic is shrinking. And if you started off with fewer than b over a susceptibles to begin with, the, the, um, the epidemic would have never gotten a foothold. So we call this number b over a the threshold. Whenever s is less than the threshold, the epidemic dies off. Whenever it's bigger than the threshold, the epidemic gets worse. So what are you going to do if you're in public policy? So our threshold is b over a, and we want to have s less than b over a. So there are three things you can try. You can try decreasing a. A is the transmission coefficient. That's the rate that has something to do with how easy it is to transmit germs. If you get people to wash their hands and to sneeze into their elbows rather than to their neighbors' faces, if you keep kids sick home, if you close schools if you have to, you can reduce the transmission coefficient. That makes the threshold higher. It makes it harder for the epidemic to, epidemic to get any traction. You can decrease the number of susceptibles. Well, that doesn't really work after the epidemic started, but the whole point of vaccines is to decrease the number of susceptibles before the epidemic gets started. If you reduce the epidemic, the number of susceptible individuals to less than B over A by vaccinating half of them, then the epidemic won't get started, and the other half of the people, the ones who didn't get vaccines, they'll be protected too. You can try increasing B, the rate at which people recover, but it doesn't work very well. Sometimes you can rush in a whole bunch of antibiotics and help fight an, an, an epidemic that way, but it's rarely effective. For the most part, if you got measles, you got to wait two weeks to recover, no matter what you do about it. And finally, if all else fails, you can wait. Eventually, epidemics always run out of susceptibles. Eventually, so many people are sick that the number of susceptibles is less than B over A. And once it hits that point, then the infection starts to die off. But you don't want to wait that long. You'd really rather stop the infection in the early stages by decreasing the number of, of the, the transmission coefficient, and preferably to keep it from getting started in the first place by decreasing the number of susceptibles.